This is the second video in a series devoted to the elementary study of Lie algebras. Now previously we looked at definitions and a bunch of examples and now we're going to look at like some common algebraic structures that Lie algebras have that are maybe in parallel with rings and groups and other things that you're more familiar with. So let's start with the definition of a Lie subalgebra. So let's start with the definition of a Lie subalgebra. So given a Lie algebra L and a vector subspace K of L, we say that K is a Lie subalgebra if, well, it's closed under the bracket operation. That's all you really need. So in other words, for all X, Y, N, K, bracket X, Y is also N, K. Okay, so next up we wanna talk about a special type of subalgebra known as an ideal. And so an ideal is, well, in parallel to an ideal of a ring or a normal subgroup of a group. So a Lie subalgebra I of L is called an ideal if for all X in L and I in I, we have bracket I X is in I. And so notice in order to bracket and get inside of the ideal here, you only need one element inside of the ideal. So we have this kind of absorption property that is common in also rings. And now there's like a way of writing this kind of on a maybe global um, notation, which is the bracket of I with L as the ideal or the subalgebra and the algebra is a subset of I. We'll go into this notation a little bit more later. Okay, so let's look at some basic examples of subalgebras, starting with a bunch of subalgebras of GLNF. Let's recall that GLNF is the set of all n by n matrices with entries from a field F, and the bracket is simply the commutator, so xy minus yx. First of all, SLNF, which we looked at that as a Lie algebra on its own earlier. So that's gonna be all elements that have trace zero. Let's recall the trace is the sum of the diagonal elements. And maybe as a homework exercise, in order to convince yourself that this is in fact a subalgebra, you could prove that the trace of xy is the same thing as the trace of yx. But that means the trace of any commutator is zero. And so if you start with two things that have trace zero, well, you're gonna end up with something that has trace zero for sure. Actually, it's a little bit stronger here, and SLN has a little bit more structure than just a subalgebra, but again, that'll be something we look at later. Next up, we've got BNF, which is the set of all upper triangular matrices. So here, the only non-zero entries are in the upper triangle, including the diagonal. So the diagonal can be non-zero and everything above the diagonal can be non-zero. But everything below the diagonal has to be zero. Then next, we've got strictly upper triangular matrices, which is NNF. So like N for nilpotent, because these are all nilpotent. In other words, you can raise them to a certain power and get zero. So here we've got zero on the diagonal, zero below the diagonal, but then you could have non-zero entries above the diagonal. And then finally, an example of a subalgebra outside of GLNF would be the span of L minus one, L zero, and L one inside of the Witt algebra. Recall we looked at the Witt algebra in the previous video. Okay, so now let's look at some examples of ideals. Okay, so now let's look at some examples of ideals, starting with SLN is an ideal of GLN. And well, this follows from that homework that I had on the previous board, but we'll look at a special case when n is equal to two just to get our hands dirty so we have a feel for what this looks like. Okay, so let's take an element of SL2. So that'll be of the form A, B, C, and then minus A. We know a minus A has to go there because we have the trace zero. So like I said, this is an SL2, maybe F and then we'll take x, y, z, w inside of g, l, 2, f. And now let's take the commutator of each of those and hopefully we will get something inside of s, l, 2. So the commutator will be something like this. So let's get it set up. So x, y, z, w. Okay, so we need to do the, do the product in one direction minus the product in the other direction. So we'll have A, B, C minus A times X, Y, Z, W minus X, Y, Z, W times A, B, C 
minus a. And I'm just going to focus on what's going on in the diagonal entry because in order to get an SL2, it doesn't matter what's happening off the diagonal, you just need the sum of the diagonals to be zero. Okay, so let's see. This top left entry will be AX plus BZ, so just by standard matrix multiplication. This bottom right entry will be CY minus AW, again by standard matrix multiplication. But then, like I said, we don't care about what's going on off the diagonal, so I'll just put some boxes there. Okay, then this will be subtracting. Well, look, again, we'll have AX plus CY in this case, so AX plus uh, CY using matrix multiplication. And then for the next bit, we'll have BZ minus AW. Okay, great. And then again, we don't know what's happening off the diagonal. We don't actually really care. We could calculate that if we wanted to, but for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. So we've got something like that. And now let's do that difference. So notice the AX terms will cancel and we'll be left with BZ minus CY. And then here the AW terms will cancel and we'll be left with CY minus BZ. And then like I said, what's going on in the off diagonal doesn't matter. Okay, so now we need to check is the trace zero? But I think it's pretty clear the trace is zero. If we add this to this, well, the BZ terms cancel and the CY terms cancel. So that tells us that we are in fact in SL2F. But that's the condition we needed to be inside of the ideal. Okay, so let's move on. Okay, so next up, I'd like to notice that BN is an example of a subalgebra which is not an ideal. And we'll look at this via a special case. And so this is important to do examples like this because anytime you're defining a structure and then a special case of that structure, well, you wanna make sure that the special case doesn't involve everything. So in other words, we defined a subalgebra and an ideal. We wanna make sure that every subalgebra is not necessarily an ideal. And that's because if every subalgebra was an ideal, then we wouldn't need two definitions. Okay. So let's look at this via the n equals two case. So let's take this element of BN. So that's pretty obviously an example of an element from B2F. And then let's take 0, 0, 0011 1 as an element of GL2F. Great. So we've got an element of B2 and an element of GL2. Now we'll take their bracket and show that we don't land in B2, which means it's not an ideal. Okay, so we'll get one zero zero zero, and then zero zero one one. Okay, so now doing the product in both directions, well, in the first direction, you'll just get a bunch of zeros, and then in the second direction, you'll get zero zero one zero. So just to be clear, this first all zeros is what we get from multiplying this on the left to this on the right. And the second matrix is the, what we get from the opposite. So this is on the left and this is on the right. So the standard commutator. But notice this difference is equal to zero, zero, minus one, zero. That's pretty clearly not an upper triangular matrix. So that is not inside of BNF. Okay, good. I guess I should say this is B2F. And then you can cook up a general example if you want. Perhaps a general example would look like one and then a bunch of zeros other than that for your element of B in. And then your element of G would have a whole row of ones on the bottom and then zeros elsewhere. So if those are both inside of BNF and GLNF respectively, but you can calculate their commutator pretty easily and show that you don't get something inside of BNF. Okay, so next up I wanna look at a special class of ideal, which is part of every Lie algebra. Next up, we're gonna look at a special subset of a Lie algebra known as the center.
So given Lie algebra L, the center, which we will denote by Z of L, is all Z in L such that X Z is equal to zero for all X in L. So it's like something that commutes with every element of L. So maybe put this in parallel to the center of a group, which you've probably heard of, or maybe even the center of a ring. Okay, so our claim is that ZL is in fact an ideal. We need to do two things. First, show that it's a vector subspace, and then show that it has this absorption property, which is this property right here. Notice that this absorption property will imply that it's a Lie subalgebra because we can just specialize this absorption property to the case where X is also in I. So this is stronger. And in fact, absorption implies this condition right here. I think that's pretty clear. Okay, so vector subspace. Okay, so let's suppose that we have A and B elements of the field and Z and W elements of the center. And what we want to show is that the linear combination AZ plus BW is also in the center. But in order to be in the center, you need to commute with everything. So let's check that this, in fact, commutes with everything. So let's take an arbitrary X in L and let's notice that the following calculation does it. So we have X bracketed with AZ plus BW using the bilinearity, or in fact, just the linearity in the second entry of the bracket. We'll have A and then XZ plus B and then XW. But let's notice that this XZ is equal to zero because Z is in the center. And this XW is equal to zero because W is in the center. But that means we get a zero here. But that means that our linear combination, AZ plus BW, is in fact in the center. But that's exactly the condition to have a vector subspace. You take two vectors and two constants and you show that the linear combination produced by that is also inside of the subset. That, what, that's what makes it a subspace. Okay, so now let's prove the absorption property. Okay, so let's take maybe a Z inside of the center and we'll take an X inside of the Lie algebra. And let's maybe spell out what we wanna show here just so that we're all on the same page. So what we want to show to make this happen is that XZ is also in the center. Okay, great. But how do we show that XZ is in the center? Well, we have to show that it commutes with everything. Okay, so let's maybe do that with the following calculation, and this is like so fast. So let's notice that Y bracketed with XZ so we want that to be equal to zero. But notice that Z is in the center. And the fact that Z is in the center immediately tells us that bracket X with Z is equal to zero. So in fact, what we're doing here is we're bracketing Y with the zero vector. But I think we proved last time that if you bracket anything with the zero vector, you get zero. I think that's pretty easy to show. It's in fact because the zero plus zero is equal to zero. That makes it all work. So anyway, we'll get zero here, but that's exactly the condition that we need for XZ to be inside of the center because it commuted with everything. Okay, so there we have it. We've got an ideal that we can get out of any Lie algebra. Okay, so let's move on to looking at quotients and homomorphism. Okay, now let's look at the notion of a quotient Lie algebra. So given a Lie algebra L with an ideal I, the quotient Lie algebra, well, it's defined to be the quotient vector space L mod I, which is the set of all cosets of I with the following bracket. So we have the bracket of the coset X plus I with Y plus I is equal to the coset of the bracket X, Y plus I. 
Okay, so let's prove the following pretty powerful result, which really explains why we define an ideal the way we do, really in any algebraic structure. And it's so that the quotient object makes sense. So let's suppose that I is a subalgebra of L, then what we'll prove is that L mod I, together with the bracket that we talked about before, is a Lie algebra if and only if I is an ideal. Okay, so let's get to it. This is an if and only if statement, so that means we have two directions to prove. Let's start with the reverse direction. So in other words, we'll suppose that I is an ideal. Okay, so in order for this to be a Lie algebra, well, it's first got to be a vector space, but it is, because a quotient vector space is always a vector space. And then the bracket needs to be alternating, and, well, it has to be bilinear, but that's kind of obvious. And it has to satisfy the Jacobi identity. And then, well, after those two, there's actually a more important thing that it has to be well-defined. So this alternating property and the Jacobi identity are going to follow like immediately from the structure inside of the Lie algebra. I'll spell it out for the alternating property. So, Let's notice that x plus i with x plus i, we want that to be equal to zero, but that's gonna be x comma x plus i, but that's gonna be zero plus i. But zero plus i is the zero element of the quotient vector space. So notice this relied on the fact that the original bracket was also alternating. And then the Jacobi identity is gonna be essentially the same thing. So we're gonna start with x plus i bracketed with y plus i and z plus i, or the bracket of those two. And then, well, all of the rest of those terms. But then this thing can be unfoiled until it looks like x comma y comma z plus i. Again, using this definition up here a few times. But then that's going to also include a bunch of other things, and that'll all collapse to zero plus i. Again, here we're just relying on the fact that our parent bracket right here satisfies the Jacobi identity because L is a Lie algebra. Okay, so what we really need to show is that this is well defined. I guess I should say that if you need to see more details of this Jacobi identity being satisfied. Well, you can just write out the details. I think it's pretty easy to fill in the dot, dot, dot there on your own. Okay, so what do I mean by well-defined? Well, anytime you're in a quotient space, you know that two elements or a single element can have two names, but really be the same thing. And you wanna make sure that your operation doesn't depend on the name that you have chosen. Okay. So let's suppose we've got an element of the quotient space L mod I with two different names, X and X prime. So in other words, X plus I is equal to X prime plus I. So those are the two names for this element. And then also let's suppose we've got Y plus I is equal to Y pr prime plus I. But what does it mean for cosets to be the same? Well, like by coset equality, which is a pretty standard result from, let's see, an abstract algebra class, it's essentially the same kind of thing going on here. We know that x minus x prime is an element of i. So in other words, it equals maybe what I'll call i1, which is in i. And then we also know that y minus y prime is an element of i, so I'll call it i2, which is in i. You know, that's coset equality. So x plus i equals x prime plus i, if and only if x minus x prime is an element of i. Okay, so now we're ready to check that this is really well defined. So let's look at the bracket x plus i with y plus i which is defined to be the bracket of xy plus i. It's defined to be that coset. But now let's solve these two equations for x and y. So that'll give us x prime plus i1, and then also y prime plus i2, and then plus i. But now let's use the bilinearity to expand that all the way out. That'll leave us with x prime, y prime, and then plus i1 with y prime, 
plus x prime with i2, and then plus i1 with i2, and then plus i. Notice that all of this stuff that I'm underlining in blue is an element of i. We know that because i is an ideal. So that makes this an element of i, this an element of i, and that an element of i. So that means this coset is the same thing as the coset x prime, y prime, plus i, because we can just pull all of those inside of the ideal i. But next up, we can rewrite that as the bracket of x prime plus i and y prime plus i. Okay, nice. But then starting here and ending here is exactly what we needed to show that this was well-defined. Now let's move on to the reverse direction. So now we're ready for the reverse direction. So we've got L mod i with this bracket as a Lie algebra, and now we want to show that i is an ideal. And we'll just do it by the definition of an ideal, which was on the previous board. So let's suppose that we've got an arbitrary element from L and an arbitrary element from i. Okay, great. But now let's look at the following bracket. So we want x bracketed with i. And then we're not just going to look at that, we're going to look at the coset. So now this is happening inside of the Lie algebra. So next up we can use this equality in reverse to write this as x plus i comma i plus i, but then that'll be the same thing as x plus i comma zero plus i, given the fact that i is in the ideal, so the coset with representative i is the same thing as the coset re with representative zero. Oh, but now we can use this again to write this as the bracket of x with 0 plus i, but as we discussed before, the bracket of x with 0 is always 0, so we get 0 plus i. Oh, but look at what we have here. We have this coset x bracket i is the same thing as this coset with representative 0, but that means that this representative must be an element of i. So that's by coset equality. So we've got bracket x i is an element of i, but that's exactly the condition we needed for i to be an ideal. Okay, so I mentioned that we were gonna look at Lie algebra homomorphisms, but I think in order to maybe spend an appropriate amount of time looking at those, we'll put those off to the next video. So I'll just leave you with some exercises. So here are a couple of exercises. The first is that homework exercise that I mentioned before. So show for all x, y, which are n by n matrices with entries from a field, that the trace of x, y is equal to the trace of y, x. And then explain how that leads you to show that s, l, n, f is an ideal of g, l, n, f. So next up, let's describe the center of g, l, 2, f and the center of g, l, 3, f. And so later we'll be able to prove that the center of GLNF has a nice uh, form. And you could maybe prove it now with brute force, but there's a nice trick later. Okay, then finally describe the center of SL2F and SL3F. And this, well actually this and perhaps this as well, but definitely this condition on the SL2 and 3F will continue.